Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Book 3 of Cicero's On the Ends, Cato, the Stoic philosopher, is arguing for what we can call the absolute primacy of virtue. What this means is that he's saying that virtue is really the good, the thing that is good for us as human beings, and everything else, if it has any value at all, it's reflected or derivative uh, from that of virtue. So nothing else really has intrinsic positive value. There is something else that has intrinsic negative value, and that would be the opposite of virtue or moral vice. And the way in which they're using virtue is both generic in the sense of, we might call it capital V, virtue, which is essentially synonymous here with moral goodness or moral value, the honestum in Latin. And or rectitudinum, right? A rectitudo, and also um, in the more specific sense of virtues, particular states of character or personality that have been developed within a human being. We're going to talk about those shortly. The first thing that I want to bring up, though, in talking about this Stoic conception of virtue, is you might say the big elephant in the room. Aren't the Stoics really saying the same thing as one of the other main schools of virtue ethics at the time, the Peripatetics or Aristotelians? And this is a live issue of contention within the discussion happening in this book. Cato says, definitely not. Cicero says, I think it is the case. You and the you Stoics and the Peripatetics or Aristotelians are just changing the words. You're talking about the same thing. You're actually on, as we say, the same page, but don't realize it. And Cato says that is definitely not the case. So let's see what Cato's argument is. The Aristotelians, in his view, say that virtue is a good thing. Insofar as they say that, they agree with the Stoics. However, the Aristotelians don't say virtue is the only good thing or the thing that makes all other goods good. Rather, they say, well, there's a lot of different good things. Aristotle comes right out and says this. Pleasure is something good. It's not the good, the way that Epicureans or other hedonists would say, but it's, it's good. It's just not as good as virtue. Virtue is better than bodily pleasure or even bodily health for that matter. Definitely better than wealth, definitely better than social prestige or honor, but all those things are in fact good things. They're just lesser goods. They're not as good as the capital G good, which is virtuous activity. So the Aristotelians are willing to recognize a whole range of goods. The Stoics say that's not the case. Virtue is the only good, the sole good. Or if you don't like the word virtue, say moral rightness or intrinsic value, right? Um, that's the sole good. All other things in that case are not really goods. Wealth is not a good. It's not something bad, but it's not a good. Pleasure feels good, but it's not a good. Pain, likewise, it's opposite, feels bad, but it's not something bad. 
And we can say the same thing about health. We can say the same thing about longevity of life. We can say the same thing about social prestige, celebrity, contacts, you name it, social media status, uh, whatever ranking you have in some sort of database. All of those things are, you might say, extraneous to the good. They are not the good itself. They could be conducive to the good. They could help you make that good uh, more active, you could say. So if you're a virtuous person and you do in fact have wealth and you can use that wealth to do be uh, beneficent actions, that's kind of good. But the wealth itself is not something good. Neither is the pleasure that results from it. Neither is the honor. Only the virtue is good. So for Cato, there's a fundamental difference between the Aristotelian and Stoic positions. And the Stoics are taking a very hard line on this. So let's talk for a minute about what this encompasses. I've used this term virtue quite a lot. So, you know, that's the one that they start out with. But you notice if you read the text that they are jumping between virtue and moral goodness or the good or the end or the highest good or any of these other sort of synonyms. And the goodness that they're talking about there is the honestum. It's a word that we get honest from. It means something that is intrinsically valuable. It's not valuable solely because it's useful or because it's pleasant. It is, it is good in itself. Um, sometimes they'll use recte or rectum or other things, rectitude, you know, uh, those sorts of, of compositions. That means sort of straightness. That's the original meaning of recte, right? Or rectum means straight, uh, not bent, going the right way. And that's a synonym for the, the honestum, the, the morally good. The other thing that we do have to talk about is, okay, so if virtue is the only good, what about our actions and choices? Our actions and choices, insofar as they are indeed virtuous, are good. And they're just as good as any other good actions. This is something that's really distinctive to the Stoic position. When you do a virtuous action that we think of as kind of a small thing, it is just as good as a virtuous action carried out by somebody who has a lot of power or money or, you know, is very successful in doing that action and it affects all sorts of other people. You know, Cato uh, says there are some actions that are bad no matter what you're doing, whether it has good effects or not. Those are stemming from vice. Likewise, there are some actions that are good, no matter whether they're successful or not, they're good just by initiating them. And the goodness is there at the very beginning of that action. So this is a very strong, as we say, deontological point of view on um, the goodness of, of actions. But virtue is what provides us with the index for that. So virtues and vices are our primary criterion. So we should talk for a minute, well, what virtues does he have in mind? The Stoics looked to the four cardinal virtues that had already been discussed by Plato. And by the time that all of this moral reflection is coming on the scene, these are recognized as sort of criteria or hallmarks of the good person. Wisdom, sometimes you'll see it translated also as prudence. Um, wisdom is the proper state of our mind. It's been fully developed. It, you know, our natural human propensities and tendencies towards seeking out truth and understanding of things are engaged. And we can figure out what is actually good for us as human beings. And not just in a general sense, but think about how to deal with the particular specific life circumstances and choices that we have to make. How do we prioritize things among each other? Justice, giving everybody what is their due. That is a key part of this. Uh, making good on obligations and promises that we have engaged ourselves in. Um, doing our duties to other people. But justice for the Stoics also includes kindness 
benignitas in, in Latin, generosity, bene- benevolence, and beneficence. So that is a key part of it. Courage, being able not just to stand up against fear, but to resist the other emotions like desire or anger and get the job done that needs to get done through difficult circumstances. Temperance, self-control, particularly with, with respect to bodily appetites, the desires for physical pleasures, the desires to avoid pain. Temperance is an integral part of that. So that gives us a little bit more understanding of that. The other thing to mention too is that he's going to bring up happiness. Beatitudo or beata vid vita, the, the happy life, the good life. And for the Stoics, happiness comprises and includes everything that is intrinsically valuable, everything that is good. So in order to be happy, you would actually need to have the virtues. And there's one point we're going to discuss a little bit later where Cato says, even if you're making progress towards the virtues, you're just as miserable as everybody else who isn't because you haven't attained that, that final point of genuine happiness. But the Stoics thought that the only thing that will in fact make us really happy, not just a facsimile of happiness, is being in, in line with the moral good. Now, there are some arguments that he provides and he says um, that... Uh, We can look at each of these. These are in rather syllogistic form. So we can look at these very quickly. The first is that whatever is good is praiseworthy, but whatever is praiseworthy is morally honorable. That is honestum. Therefore, that which is good is morally honorable. Whatever is good is going to be the honestum in that case. Now, you could could quibble with some of the premises to this but if you accept those premises you wind up at that conclusion and he says that the usual line of reply is to deny the major premise and say not everything good is praiseworthy for there's no denying that what is praiseworthy is morally honorable but he says this isn't actually going to work then he brings up another really interesting argument who can be proud who can glory in a life that is miserable or not happy it says, one can only be proud of one's lot when it's a happy one. So this proves the happy life is a thing that deserves that one should be proud of it. And then he says, what can you actually be proud of? Well, only what's morally honorable. Now, again, you might reject some of these premises. And I, I would imagine that many people that he has in mind would, in fact, reject these. But he would say they're wrong to reject those. And you could provide other arguments for that. He also gives us another one about courage. He says, could it be denied it's impossible for there ever to exist a person of steadfast, firm, and lofty mind, a person we call a brave one, unless it be established that pain is not an evil. And what's the argument there? If you think that pain or death really is something bad, then you can't help but not be courageous. So if you want to be courageous, you have to actually think that these things are not genuinely bad, the way, say, the Aristotelians would say, but just indifference, things that you can face. Probably not the best argument there. Um, The last thing that he says that I think is particularly interesting and worth keeping in mind, the Stoics adopted a position on virtue and the moral good that they fully understood was paradoxical. What does it mean to be paradoxical? It means that people are going to find this very counterintuitive and have a hard time buying into it. The argument, and they they provided actually a number of sort of analogies and arguments to support this, is leading to the conclusion that virtue, the moral good, happiness, these things do not um, have increase or decrease. Uh, They don't have increase in the sense of growing. They don't have addition in the sense that you could add anything to it. And you also can't decrease it or take anything away from it. So it doesn't matter whether you're virtuous for a day and then die immediately after that, or whether you're virtuous over the course of 60 years. It's the same moral value. It's the same happiness. 
This does seem rather paradoxical. The Stoics would express this through analogies like saying you can drown just as well in an inch of water as you can in an entire ocean or a puppy before it opens its eyes is just as blind at that point as a, a blind person later on. There's argument after argument after argument that they adduce. And this is a very tough position to accept that there, you know, every single virtue and every single virtuous act is just as good as every other one. Likewise, every vicious act is just as bad as every other one as well. But if you accept the stoic conception of these things, that is the conclusion that it will lead you to. So virtue for the stoics then, and you might say moral goodness, because these are essentially synonymous, becomes the only thing that should motivate us, the only thing that should be taken into account when we are trying to figure out how to approach what is going to make us happy, what is our final end, or what is the greatest good. 